But first, I get to speak to you for an hour. And uh, uh, basically, as, as uh, Jose Ramon said, uh, in our business, it's very hard to figure out what is the most important thing. I wrote a book about 10 years ago called, uh, in Spanish, Lo Mas Importante, the most important thing. But there is no one important thing. There are many things that, that an investor has to consider. But the truth is, the most important thing is risk. And I believe that it is the job of the professional investor to control risk for the clients. The, go the job is not to make a lot of money because usually the market goes up. Usually it's easy to make money. The challenge is to make money at the same time that you control risk. And uh, a, a portfolio which has the opportunity to make money but with the risk under control is, in my opinion, the mark of the professional investor. So the question is, how do we do that? Now, I have th three different presentations that I make, and at the suggestion of my hosts, I have combined for you some aspects of all three. So you'll see the, the dividing lines in the presentation. First, the truth about investing. Most investors cannot see the future better than anybody else. And trying to predict the future will not produce investment success. My, one of my heroes, John Kenneth Galbraith, said, we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know they don't know. The truth is the future is uncertain, and yet what is investing but deploying money for the future? Now, most investors act as if they can see the future, and they base their investment decisions on their view of the future. Either they think they can, or they think they have to pretend that they can for their business. Now, I think it's dangerous, because if it turns out that they really can't, as I believe, then, then there's a problem. There was a behaviorist named Amos Tversky at Stanford University, and he said something that I thought was brilliant. He said, it's frightening to think that you don't know something, but more frightening to think that, by and large, most people go around acting as if they do. We have an American humorist, Mark Twain, who said it even better. It's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that isn't true. And this is extremely important. I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of keeping this in mind. If, you, if, you, if everything you say, as for me, if every sentence you say starts with the words, I may be wrong, but, or I don't know, but, then you're unlikely to get into trouble. The way you get into trouble is thinking that you really do know what the future holds, and of course, in my opinion, being wrong. Now, in our business, once in a while, somebody gets famous for a particularly brilliant prediction. But it usually turns out that they can't repeat that. And so I say that our business is full of people who got famous for being right once in a row. And of course, being right once in a row doesn't do any good because you never know if the next one has any value. But that's the way it is. And almost nobody is right much more than once in a row. And everybody in our business makes predictions of what's going to happen. And if you look at the great investors of the world, virtually none of them got famous by being able to predict the future of what we call macro. And when I'm talking about forecast today, I'm talking about the macro, economies, markets, currencies, uh, interest rates. These are the big picture factors, they're very important. Everybody would like to know what they imply, but they just can't. And uh, uh, Warren Buffett said to me one time, for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important, and it has to be knowable. 
and the macro is extremely important. And everybody says to me, how can you not base your investment approach on macro? It's so important. I say, yes, but it's not knowable. And if it's not knowable, then trying to base your approach on macro is really a waste of time or worse. Now, one of the main reasons for the difficulty of making predictions is the enormous influence of randomness. And, you know, things often, we know how it should go, but it, something else occurs instead. Impossible things happen all the time, and things that are extremely likely to happen fail to happen all the time. Now, let's go back in my country exactly two and a half years to November of 2016. There were two things that were considered certainties, not probable, certainties. Number one, Hillary Clinton would be elected president. And number two, if by some quirk of fate Donald Trump won, the market would collapse. And so instead, Trump won, and the market went straight up. And if that's not enough to convince people that they don't know what the future holds, then I don't think I can. But that's what happened. And uh, so nothing is more common than investors who are right for the wrong reason. And they get famous. But of course, we shouldn't follow them. That's the importance of randomness. I think that investors should accept the fact that they can't see the macro future and restrict themselves to doing the things that are within their power. These include gaining insight into what I call the knowables, companies, industries, and securities. And those are things where you can know more than the other person if you work hard and have skill and wisdom. And the other thing we can do is we can behave in what I call a contrarian or counter-cyclical way, and that's most of what I'll talk about this morning. How do you prepare for the future if you don't know it? And the answer is, we may not know what lies ahead, but we should understand where we are today and what that implies for the cycle. And I think it's, Im it's possible to improve investment results by making tactical decisions based on where we stand today and whether it calls for more aggressiveness or more defensiveness. And these decisions do not have to be made on the basis of guesses about the future. They can be made based on an understanding of the present. Where are we today? And what does that imply for the future? And what does that imply for how we should behave? So the thing that gets most people into trouble in investing is not the inability to see the future. It's the inability to control their own emotions. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Investors swing like a pendulum between fear and greed and optimism or pessimism, risk tolerance and risk aversion. And usually they swing in the wrong direction. And they warm to things as things go well and prices rise, and they get afraid as things go poorly and prices fall. And we want to try to do the opposite. Most investors behave pro-cyclically. They follow the cycle rather than anti-cyclical, as I will describe. And it's essential, in my opinion, to behave counter-cyclically. The cyclical ups and downs do not go on forever. Usually, if they feel like they will. They feel like there's either a virtuous circle that will make things go well forever, or a harmful circle that will make them go badly forever. But usually, that's not the case. Usually, we have ups and downs. And 45 years ago, somebody did me the favor of explaining to me, gave me the, the greatest gift, the greatest regalo the three stages of the bull market. And if you understand this, you're almost ready to become a professional. The first stage, when only a few exceptionally bright people understand that there could be improvement. The second stage, 
when most people understand that improvement is actually taking place, and the third stage when everybody believes that things will get better forever. So if you buy in the first stage, when most people don't see a better future, when there's very little optimism included in asset prices, you get a bargain and you can make a lot of money. If you do it in, if you buy in the second stage, when everybody understands that improvement is taking place, you don't get a bargain, you do okay, you follow the cycle, you buy in at a fair level. But if you buy in the third stage, when everybody thinks things will get better forever, and when asset prices reflect a great deal of optimism, you pay high prices, which set you up for substantial losses. So it, 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 the interesting thing about investing is it's not what you do, it's when you do it. It's not what you buy, it's when you buy it, under what conditions, and at what prices. So the key to investing is not buying good things, it's buying things well. You have to understand the difference between a bueno and bien. And it's buying bien that makes for success. When I started at Citibank, which was uh, uh, 50 years ago this month, the bank bought the stocks of what were called the Nifty 50, the 50 best and fastest growing companies in America. Companies that were so terrific that it didn't matter what price you paid. That was the official theory. And they were selling at very high prices because they were such wonderful companies. And if you came in and you held them for five years, my first five years in the business, you lost almost all your money investing in the best companies in America. So buying high quality assets is not the key because they were buying in the third stage. The key is to understand where you are and to buy assets in the first stage and be careful in the third stage. That's a big part of today's message. So it's important to practice what is called contrarian behavior and to do the opposite of what others do at the extremes because the others are primarily wrong. Uh, and uh, there's a belief that things are safe when things are going well. Actually, that's the riskiest thing. The riskiest thing in the world is the belief that there's no risk, since this makes prices very high and sets the stage for bad experiences. We must sell when others are buying most aggressively and buy when they're selling most aggressively. And Buffett says it great as usual. He says, the less prudence with which others conduct their affairs, the greater the prudence with which we must conduct our own affairs. When other people are unafraid and forcing prices high, we must be cautious. When other people are terrified and selling and pushing prices down, we should turn aggressive. And it's, it's, it's that, that's the bottom line, uh, of course, if only it was that simple. Now, the second part of this presentation uh, comes from one called Mastering the Market Cycle, Getting the Odds on Your Side. And that's the name of uh, my new book, which came out in October in the States and is now available here in Spanish. And I must say, that both of my books have been translated into Spanish, and you can only imagine how frustrating it is, because I have no idea what it says. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea the quality of the translation. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to believe that my ideas are portrayed accurately, but quién sabe. So, and I believe that there are cycles and that they're extremely important to understand. I believe there always will be cycles. I have followed cycles for 50 years. I think I've been able to help our clients by dealing with the cycles. And halfway through writing the book, a thought occurred to me. Why are there cycles? That's really an important question. Why do cycles occur? If the US GDP grows about 2% a year on average, well, why doesn't it just grow 2% every year? Why sometimes three and sometimes one? 
and sometimes four and sometimes negative in a recession. The S&P average of stocks uh, returns about 10% uh, a year on average, and it has done so now for about 90 years, almost 10% a year. Why doesn't it just give 10% every year? And in fact, if you look at the history, rarely is the return between 8 and 12. It's usually much better than 12 or much worse than 8. So why is the average not the norm? And uh, uh, this is a very important question to understand because of, in order to deal with cycles. And the answer is simple, that the positive trends in the economy or the market eventually go to excess. Remember the third stage. And those excesses correct on their own or are corrected. And that's the most of what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this section. And so rather than thinking of the cycle in terms of ups and downs, which I always did and most people do, I think it's better to think of excesses and corrections. Excesses when things go too strong and corrections when they go too weak. So, and why do we have excesses? Because of the involvement of people. This is not mechanics. This is not physics. This, this is an area where people have a very strong impact. And Richard Feynman, who was a great physicist, said physics would be much harder if electrons had feelings. We walk in this room, we turn on the light switch, and the lights go on every time. Why? Because the electrons flow from the light switch to the light fixture every time. The electrons never say, eh, not today, I'm tired, Con estoy cansado. They never go in the wrong direction. They never go on strike. And they always do what they're supposed to do. But people rarely, in my opinion, do uh, what they're supposed to do, and especially not at the extremes. And because economies and markets are made up of people, and people have feelings, we get cycles. So, for example, positive feelings can make the directors of a company anticipate big demand and build a factory and hire workers and, and, and produce for inventory. And if they all do it at the same time, then we get a period of above average growth from the factory building and the inventory producing. And then that we have an, what's called a, an up cycle. In the market, positive investor psychology causes stock prices to grow faster than the value of companies is growing. The value of companies may grow 6, 8, 10% a year on average, but in the 1990s, for example, stocks in the US, the S&P 500, appreciated 20% a year. So the value of companies was growing like this. The, the price of stocks was growing like this. That's dangerous because that creates an excess. And then eventually the excesses can be corrected. So if every factory management builds a new factory, and hires workers and produces for inventory in anticipation of strong demand, we may get to a point where there are too many factories and too much in inventory, and earnings are disappointing, and then they close the factories, they lay off the workers, they sell from inventory rather than produce, and we have a period of below average economic growth or maybe negative economic growth, which becomes a recession. Likewise, if prices outstrip the value of companies for long enough and become too high, they can't stay up, they can't go up further, they have to flatten out or decline. That's a period of correction. So bullish periods are followed by bearish periods. So it's the creation of excesses and corrections, and I think it's better to think of cycles that way than ups and downs. Now, the next question that's important is, the cycles that I've been talking about, are they dependable or not? And the best way to understand the answer to that question is another quote from our friend Mark Twain, who said that history does not repeat, 
but it does rhyme. Very important. This is a theme that runs through my book. The details of cycles are always different from one to the next. The, the amplitude of the fluctuations, the length of the cycle, and the speed of the fluctuations, always different. And also, different are the causes of the cycles and the effects of the cycles, the ups and downs. And uh, people nowadays say to me, well, this cycle, which cycle from the past is it like? And it has some characteristics of others, but it's never quite the same. History does not repeat. But there are certain underlying themes that do repeat or do, re do rhyme from one cycle to the other. And if we can learn about them and recognize them, then we can be ahead of the game. So, for example, in my period in this business, I've lived through about a half a dozen uh, important bull markets. And in general, they have certain themes that, that do repeat. And here they are. Too much optimism, too little risk aversion, and too much capital availability. And if you, if you look at those, and you think about those, those three things in themselves are a pretty good recipe for a bull market. And it's pretty hard to imagine having a bull market without them. So these are the themes that we should associate with a bull market, which is to say a period of appreciation to excess. Now let's talk about the three. First of all, optimism. Most people think, or many people think, that, that asset price rises are produced by good events. But the, the connection is not just between events and prices. It's events and psychology. It's events and how they are perceived that produce changes in asset prices. And the role of perception or psychology in the setting of asset prices is extremely important. All things being equal, a high level of optimism will cause things to be priced high relative to their fair value, or what we call the intrinsic value. So it's the job of the professional, in my opinion, to figure out for each stock, company, or building, what is the intrinsic value? And I'd like to buy when the price is below the intrinsic value and sell when it's above. And I think that's a simple recipe for how an investor should behave. So we have to figure out the intrinsic value. But clearly, in a period of great optimism regarding the future, prices will tend to be high relative to the intrinsic value. We want to know that. And the higher the optimism, most of the times, the higher the price. And as I say here, if I could know only one thing about every investment that I was considering, it might be how much optimism is priced into the shares. And that's an important element in considering every bull market. Secondly, risk aversion. Risk aversion is not a concept that most people think about every day, but it's extremely important. And most people are afraid of losses. That is to say they are risk averse. And uh, for most people, if they make a thousand euros, they're okay. But if they lose a thousand euros, they feel terrible. So the losses count more than the gains for most people. So most people are biased towards risk aversion. And risk aversion is a very, very important ingredient in the markets. When people are risk averse as they should be, then what happens? If they consider an investment, they study it thoroughly. They make only conservative assumptions. They are rigorous in their analysis. They demand a margin, what we call a margin of safety. I want to be sure that if things go poorly, I'll be OK. And they demand risk compensation. If they're going to do something which is risky, they demand an exceptional return as a potential reward. So when we have risk aversion and we have conservatism and caution and diligence and, and demands 
for uh, risk premiums, then we can say that the market is safe and sane. But when people get excited about the future and they get excited about what's been going on, they forget to be risk averse. They become risk tolerant. They become accepting of risk. And when they do, what happens? They say, well, it's not so important to do due diligence and to make conservative assumptions, because if I'm too careful, then I will miss something and my friend will get it. And you know, there, there, there was a, there's a book by a man named Kindleberger who says there is nothing worse for your mental condition than to watch a friend get rich. <laughs> and eventually in the market, fear of missing out takes over from fear of losing money, and then people do bad things. So we have to understand whether the market is based on risk aversion or on risk tolerance. And when it's risk tolerance, because people are excited, then we have to understand that the market can be a dangerous place. Number three, the impact of capital availability. The market is an auction place, especially for a, a good way to think of it is the loan market. You know, you, you want to borrow some money, you go to a, some banks, each one bank tells you what they'll do to provide you money. But if there's too much capital in the hands of people, and they're too eager to get to put it to work because they're afraid of missing something, then the bidding goes too high. And the price becomes excessive, at which point the perspective return is low and the risk is high. And we want to know that. When there's too much money chasing too few deals, those are the seven worst words in the world, too much money chasing too few deals. And it happens from time to time. And I wrote, uh, I wrote a, mo a memo in, I write memos to the clients and uh, uh, the, the people from the bank can help you get them if you're interested. And I wrote one in February 07, before the global crisis, entitled The Race to the Bottom. Because the bidding was too strong, which meant that the winners of the auction were winning the opportunity to make bad loans and buy overpriced securities. We can figure out when that's the case, if we have exceptional judgment, and we can act accordingly. So I'm going to sum up on the subject of cycles by taking you through a typical one. And I hope this is helpful. On the way up, let's say, so we start off, and there's been a bad experience, and we're at a low point. And then things start to head up. And on the way up, economic fundamentals are improving, and earnings are increasing and beating expectations, and the media are reporting only good news, because that's what they do. And as a result, investor expectations for the future rise, psychology gets stronger, people perceive only favorable developments, capital is readily available, asset prices rise, the holders of assets are happy and want to buy more. And the people who haven't been in the market are unhappy because of jealousy and begin to buy. Everybody wants to buy. Nobody wants to sell. Risk aversion evaporates. And what do people say? They say, risk is my friend. The more risk I take, the more money I make. And any, anyway, I don't see much to worry about. And when that becomes the case, then prices go too high. And eventually, <clears throat> we reach something that investors, professionals call a top, the top, the maximum, the price be which, beyond which the market will not go. And at the top, asset prices are high, prospective returns are low or negative, and risk is high. This is the time for caution. But most people are unable to be cautious at the top since the high in prices corresponds with the high in emotion. No one's willing to bear the risk of selling and missing out on the future gains. And that's human nature. Eventually, the top is passed. And now we're on the way down. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and on the way down, economic fundamentals deteriorate, 
earnings decline and fall short of expectations, and the media report now only bad news. And as a result, investors' expectations decline, psychology gets weaker, people see only undesirable invest, uh, developments, asset prices fall, holders of assets are chagrined and sell, and the people who haven't held assets pat themselves on the back for their wisdom, but of course, refuse to buy. Now risk aversion grows, and investors flee from risk, saying bearing risk is just another way to lose money. I don't care if I ever make a euro in the market again, I just don't want to lose anymore. Get me out. And the worse things go, and the lower prices go, the more people want to sell. And that's human nature. All you have to do is understand human nature. And at the bottom, asset prices are low, and prospective returns are ultra high, and risk is low, this is the time to be aggressive in the market. But most people are terrified at this point because the low in prices corresponds with the low in psychology. And they just can't move ahead because they're depressed and they're cautious. So that's a cycle. And you can see how the events conspire to cause people to do it wrong. There's nothing that says sell at the top other than your own mentality, and there's nothing that says buy at the bottom. And we see this all the time, but this is human nature, and it'll never change. Now, the subtitle of the book is Getting the Odds on Your Side, and that's very important. We never know what the future holds. Remember what I said. You can't do anything which is sure to be right or, or, or anything close to certainty. All you can do is get the odds of a favorable future on your side. So the way I think of this, and this is described in the book at length, because I think it's important, is the future is like a lottery. There's a bowl, and it's full of lottery tickets. And the lottery tickets are the possible future outcomes. And there are many of them. And it's because there are many possible future outcomes <coughs> that the world is uncertain and investing is risky. And something, fate, or whatever you want to call it, reaches into the bowl and pulls one ticket. All the tickets in the bowl are the possible outcomes, and the one that is selected is the actual outcome. And we never know which one it's going to be. You reach in the bowl, you get a ticket. It could be any of the tickets in the bowl, and there are many. Now, does that mean that we can't know anything about the future, that we can't deal intelligently with the future? And no, it doesn't mean that. What we can know is the mix, the character of the tickets in the bowl. Sometimes there are a lot of good tickets and not too many bad ones. And sometimes there are a lot of bad tickets and not too many good ones. So you want to invest when the odds are in your favor. When are the tickets in the bowl most favorable? When are the odds in your favor when we're at a low? When are the tickets in the bowl unfavorable? When are the odds against you when we're at a high? So the question is, can we figure out the difference? So when are the odds against you? When are there more losing tickets in the bowl than winners? And the answer is, if you put all the things together that I've said so far, when there's a high level of investor optimism, when investors are spurred on by greed and excitement and jealousy of other people's good results, when there have been good results in the market to date because that reassures people, when investors are happy with their gains or jealous of the gains of others, when there is unwise risk tolerance, and when there's eagerness to supply capital. And when are these things seen? At cyclical highs. You can't see these things at lows. There's no optimism. There's no greed. There's no willingness to provide capital at lows. If, if those things existed, we wouldn't be at a low. These things uh, are the fear, uh, the, the greed, and so forth. They're seen at highs. And when are the odds? in your favor. 
What causes there to be more winning tickets in the bowl than losers? <coughs> the answer is when there's a lack of optimism, a high level of fear, poor recent market performance, widespread losses, excessive risk aversion, and reluctance to supply capital. And if you see these things, then clearly people are going to be upset and fearful, and as a result, prices are going to be low. And when are these things seen? At cyclical lows. Now, where are we now? Well, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> the, the line moving through the chart is the fair value, the intrinsic value, the central value, the norm, the right value, whatever you want to call it. And then, of course, with market fluctuates around it, excesses and corrections. So as depicted here, I think that we're somewhat above the intrinsic value. It's hard to say exactly where, we're, where we are, but I think we're above intrinsic value. And, uh, you know, this, uh, I'll talk to a minute more uh, about the where we are, but that's how I would sum up. Now, what's going to happen tomorrow? Let's assume that I'm correct. Let's assume that, that the market really is somewhat above the intrinsic value. What does that imply for performance tomorrow? By which I don't mean tomorrow, tomorrow. I mean over the next year. And the answer is, who knows? The fact that something is overpriced does not mean that it's going to go down. Because if you, could, if you look back at the last, uh, the, if you look back at the last cycle, the last time we were at the same place, you can see that it went much higher. So the fact that we're in a little bit overpriced doesn't mean we're not becoming more overpriced. These trends continue until they stop. But the question is, what's the, where are the odds? And it is true that from this point in the cycle, we can have up or flat or down. All three are possible. Does that mean that they're equally possible? And the answer is no. We're more likely to have a decline than a gain. The odds are against us when the price is uh, above the intrinsic value, but not to the point where we should have certainty. Knowing where we stand in the cycle and knowing the odds of success can deliver one of the greatest advantages in investors' world, but it's not perfect. So now, if we, if we have established, I have established to my satisfaction, I don't know about yours, the fact that we're a little bit overpriced today, now I'm going to talk about how one goes about investing in what I call an, a low return world, which is where I think we are. In looking at today's market conditions, and by the way, my, these remarks do not apply just to Spain or just to Europe or just to the US or just to China or just to stocks or just to bonds. These are general comments about all the markets. But when I look out today, <coughs> I see that the uncertainties are unusual in terms of their number and level, that prospective returns in many asset classes are relatively low, that asset, asset prices range from full to excessive, and risky behavior is common. The bottom line for me of these four things is that we are living in a low return, high risk world. But our money has to go someplace and the rest of this presentation will be about how we figure that out. Now I look out at the environment of the last couple of years and what do I see? We're in the 10th year of an economic recovery in the states and the longest recovery in history ran 10 years. In fact, we're in the 11th month of the, of the 10th year. So by historic standards, we're getting very late in the cycle. There is no rule that says because the, there's never been a, a recovery in the states that went below, beyond 10 years, this one can't either. There's no gate that comes down on the 10th anniversary and says the recovery has to stop. But what? What are the odds? What are the odds that the 
economic recovery continues for another five years? Or what are the odds that it stops relatively soon, but certainly not today? We're in the longest bull market in history. Stocks have risen. You know, the, the, the low was reached on March the 9th of uh, 09. So we are more than 10 years into the bull market. It's more than it, any other in history. There are a few super stocks called the FANGs, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, uh, which are moving way, way, way up, getting everybody excited. Some, some group of what I call super stocks is present in every bull market. There's very strong demand for corporate credit. I wrote a memo in September entitled, Too Much Money Chasing Too Few Deals. That has been the case, in my opinion, in corporate credit. There's money flowing into emerging market debt. And in normal, cautious, risk-averse times, the, mon the money is not so eager to get into the emerging markets. But in, in bullish, aggressive, excited times, it is. And by the way, back in, I guess it's now two years, back in May of 17, uh, the world was prepared to buy 100-year bonds of Argentina uh, at 9%. And you know, Argentina had, uh, I think, five devaluations in the prior century. So what's the probability that Argentina is going to get through the next century without a devaluation? Not, not high. And yet people were willing to lend Argentina money for 100 years. That's a sign of optimism and aggressiveness on the part of most investors. We have record financing for private equity, which is piling up money, which is a statement that if you, if you buy corporate assets and you buy it with borrowed money, uh, you'll make a lot. We have an onrush of capital for technology and venture investing, which of course requires great bullishness because it's all about big gains in the future. Everybody knows that eight or nine out of every 10 venture investments fail, but they're seduced by the opportunity to make 100 times your money in Uber or Lyft, and so the money is now flowing in. And finally, investment in cryptocurrencies. And I see that Bitcoin has now doubled in the last few months. Of course, it's, it's down uh, about almost two-thirds from the high at the end of 17, but there's excitement about crypto. So you take all these things together, and by the so I think one of the most important words that I'd like to teach you today in English is the word inference. The important thing is not what happened. These are the events that have occurred or are occurring. The important thing is, what do they mean? What should you conclude? What message should you take away from the events that are occurring? And in my opinion, when you see these things, what it tells me you look at that list, it says to me, the things that are governing the market today are optimism, trust in the future, faith in investing and investors, a low level of skepticism, risk tolerance, not risk aversion. The question is, do you agree that these are the proper inferences? And if they are, what do they tell you about the market? What they tell me is that this is not a positive climate for prospective returns and safety. In this kind of climate, safety and returns are not made easy. They're made hard to get. Now, let's talk about why prospective returns are low. Uh, we mentioned risk aversion. And I said, as, as I said to you, it's an extremely important concept. It's not one that most people are familiar with. But I was very fortunate it, it, back in the middle 60s to go to graduate school at University of Chicago, where they were teaching a new investment theory. And what it taught was that there's a line like this that connects return and risk. And as you can see, the line slopes up and to the right. And what that means is that as, as, as perceived risk increases, perceived return increases. That's where people get this belief that the more risk they take, the more money they make. But it can't be that easy, because if it was true that you could depend on risky assets to make you a lot of money, then they wouldn't be risky. So there must be something wrong with that expectation. No, what that means is that assets that are perceived as being risky have to be perceived as offering higher returns, or else nobody will make those investments. 
but they don't have to deliver. And you have to understand the difference between expectations and, and events. But anyway, there is an expectation that riskier assets will produce higher returns, and that is embodied in the line that goes up and to the right. And it starts with something called the risk-free rate, ah, here, which is the return on the safest investments, which is 30-day treasury bills. And it proceeds from there up and to the right. And all asset classes fall into line. So if you go back a reasonable period of time, it looked like this. So you have the risk-free rate, then you have treasuries, then you have, which are a little riskier, then you have high-grade bonds, still riskier, quality stocks, aggressive stocks, high-yield bonds, private equity, and the line slopes up and to the right, as it should. Every investment which is a little riskier should appear to offer a little more return, or else the market is not rational. And that's the way it was. I'm going to say, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. And that's the way it should be. The, the issue is that when we got into the global financial crisis, the central banks of the world uh, were afraid about the economic future, and so they lowered the risk-free rate. And when they lowered the risk-free rate, everything else fell with it. The return on treasuries and high grades and quality stocks and high-yield bonds and private equity also declined. That's what we call a parallel shift. The line fell and throughout. And so the returns on other assets fell into line with the decreased return on uh, the risk-free rate. And that's approximately where we are today. It would not make any sense if the risk-free rate is very low. And of course, in, in Europe, there's trillions of dollars of uh, bonds that have negative yields. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't make any sense for, <coughs> for you know, the risk-free rate to be low or negative and other classes to be safely high. So everything falls in line. And it, it, so because the rates are low, look, can we back up one? Yeah. You can see that the people who used to invest here and get good returns with safety now have to go out here to high risk behavior to try to get the similar return. And so investors in many markets have taken on increased risk to try to get the returns they want. Too much money is chasing the limited opportunities in risk markets, and the race to the bottom is underway. And as I said before, the seven worst words in the world are out there today, in my opinion. Too much money chasing too few deals. If that's true, you want to know about it. Maybe you don't want to participate in that giveaway. Now, as investment managers, as we, as your bank, what can we do for you? Everything we do falls under one of two headings, asset selection or cycle positioning. Asset selection means trying to hold more of the things that will do well and less of the things that will do less well. And cycle positioning means trying to have more money invested more aggressively when the odds are in your favor and less money invested aggressively when the odds are against you. It doesn't mean in, out. People always say to me, is this the time to get in or get out? Is it the time to buy or sell? And the answer is it's not black or white. It's more aggressive sometimes and more defensive at other times. And some people say, well, yeah, there is no better or worse time to be aggressive or defensive. And I think that that's sh selling short because if you say that, then you're giving up on the second of these features. And I think the second pursuit can be very valuable. Now, I believe that there are times for aggressiveness and there are times for defensiveness. When prices are low, pessimism is widespread, and investors are fleeing from risk, most investors, that's the time you should become aggressive, or we. But when prices are high, and enthusiasm is every place, and investors are risk tolerant, that's the time to be defensive. I think it's very easy to see that. It's not so easy to do. It's not so easy to understand. It's not so easy to take the action. But that's the very simple formula. So if you agree, then the question is, which time is this?
Are investments rich or cheap? Where do we stand in the market cycle? How should we be positioned versus our normal risk posture? Is today, if you have a certain normal risk attitude, today should you be more aggressive or more defensive? It's a very simple question. Should we emphasize offense or defense? Should we worry more about losing money or worry more about missing opportunity? Today, will there be a reward for n money and nerve to invest or will there be a reward for conservatism and risk control. And our mantra today and recently, last few years, has been move forward but with caution. Things are not so bad that we have to be terrified and not move forward, not invest. We are essentially fully invested today, but with caution, which means that our portfolio, we're always cautious at Oak Tree, our portfolio is even more cautious than usual today. We are fully invested with a cautious portfolio. And I think it's a good formula for success. Now, you should say, well, why not no investments? Well, the answer is we can't be sure that the future is bad. Why not fully invested? Well, we can't be sure that it's good. And the evidence to me is that it's not quite good. So fully invested, but with caution. So here's the last slide. I, as I said to you, I think we're in a low return world. And if so, the options are limited. You can invest as you always had and expect your historic returns, but the truth is they're not out there because nothing yields what it used to yield. T t it used to be a bond yield five, today it may yield negative. So you can't get your historic returns by doing the things that you used to be, do historically. So maybe number two. Number two says you should invest as you always have and expect that the, that the returns will be lower. And that is mature. That's grown up. It's not fun, but it's the truth. Number three, you can reduce the risk in your portfolio to prepare for bad times and accept a return which is even lower still. And that is cautious. Number four, you can go to cash at, at in your case, a negative return and wait for a buying opportunity. The trouble is, it's, it's tough to wait for a few years. And if the market does well, as it has in our country in recent years, you'll have a lot of regret. Or you can go the other way. You can do five. You can increase your risk in pursuit of high returns in the belief that you'll get higher returns if you do riskier things. Or number six, you can put money into what I call special niches and invest with what I hope are special people in the hope that you can do better. Now, in my opinion, none of these is entirely satisfactory. They all have problems. There's only one observation, however. This is all the choices there are. When you're living in a high risk, low return world, there's no easy way to make a satisfactory return so you really have to choose between these. And by the way, that means without number one, because number one doesn't exist. So to me, the right things for today are a mix of two, three, and six. I wouldn't do four. I don't think it's appropriate to go to cash. The, the outlook is not so bad, and the asset prices are not so high that you should go to cash. And you shouldn't, in my opinion, certainly do number five. I don't think this. There's any point today in being aggressive. So some combination, in my opinion, of two, three, and six. And that's what I wanted to tell you today at the request of uh, the bank. So now is the time for me to answer your questions. And I'm sure you have a lot. Who's first? No. I'm not first. I'm hoping somebody well, out there would be first. Good. Uh, me too. There is a microphone at the back. If you can hold on for a second, Logan, and we'll get the microphone to you, please. Puede acercar el micrófono, por favor. A la derecha, aquí al señor. Good morning, Mr. Marks. Good morning. Um, could I just, may I please ask a very provocative question? Um, you mentioned 
that emotions tend to get in the way of investors hopefully doing uh, what is right. Mm -hmm. There is something called artificial intelligence these days. Mm -hmm. And there are vendor suppliers or there are people that are building that technology into uh, programmatic investing. Would that help to, to uh, program the roadmap as you have put it? Uh, the roadmap of when prospecting returns are high or when they're low? and take emotion out of it? I, and does it mean that some of us are out of a job if that happens? Yes, well, um, uh, as to your last question, a lot of people have made a lot of money working in the investment management business without adding much value. Uh, and and, and it, it, because their efforts have been unsuccessful, but they've been highly paid for it, that's the reason for the passive and index investment movement. And it, it, you know, it was just, people were just starting to theorize about it when I was in graduate school. And then in 1974, Vanguard and Jack Bogle invented the first index fund. And now it, 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 it accounts for a reasonable amount of capital. So yes, over the years, people have, have, have invested unsuccessfully and been highly paid for that, which sh if you think about it, should not be a formula for, the, for success. And so the success for those people, and there are lots of them, is ending. And a lot of money is flowing from uh, active to passive investing. Uh, and it's important to realize, not because the results of passive investing are so good, but because the results of active investing are so bad. That's number one. So as a result, I wrote a memo, and I say that about most things, uh, a year ago, last June, entitled Investing Without People. And there are movements like indexation and passive investing and algorithmic investing, systematic, and eventually AI and machine learning where uh, processes or computers will replace people because at least they won't make the emotional mistakes. And so I think that over time we will see uh, AI uh, coming into use and uh, and a lot of people will be out of work. You may have asked facetiously, but I think it's going to be true. Uh, or at least investing will stop being one of the highest paid jobs in the world for large numbers of people. I still believe that there will be a place for exceptional people. Because I think that the computer, you know, as I say in the memo, I don't think a computer can sit down with with, uh, with somebody and figure out whether or not he's Steve Jobs. I don't think that a computer can look at five business plans from Silicon Valley and know which one is eBay or Amazon. So I think that exceptional people who can make exceptional judgments will still be helpful to investors, uh, but not clearly everyone. Everyone's opinion on average is worth about average. So I hope that answers it. And, and, and by the way, so you can read that memo uh, on, online at oaktreecapital.com. They're all there and they're all free. So the price is right. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I hope you will. Next question, please. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what's your opinion about the high frequency trading and the influence to the market? Um, high frequency trading is, um, it's now, I believe, becoming clear that high frequency trading benefits from knowing what orders are coming behind. It, 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 there's an activity uh, in investing called front running. And let's you see, you give, you give your broker an order to buy a million shares of General Motors. If someone knows about that order, then they go out and they buy 100 shares. When your, market, when your order comes into the market and buying a million shares drives up the price, the person who bought ahead of you makes money. Most high frequency trading, or much, is front running. And the 
the, uh, the, the high frequency traders have positioned their computers <coughs> right near the stock exchange. So they know in advance which orders are coming. They know it electronically, not, uh, you know, not the normal way. But they can buy, <coughs> everything's nanoseconds. They can buy a little bit just ahead of the order and profit from it. And, 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 and front running is a formula for success. Now, eventually, I think they'll fix that. And, uh, but in the meantime, I mean, the, the, the high frequency trading makes a, a penny on every trade. And, but if you do a lot of trades and you use a lot of leverage, then the pennies add up. And I think that's the answer. So, uh, you know, to date it has worked. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it, I don't know if it'll work forever. Another question. These are good questions this morning. Good morning. Uh, my question is, if you were to structure, to structure a new uh, asset management company, what would you do? What would be your priorities? Well, um, I, I left out some discussion of a very important concept. And I, for, my first important recommendation is buy my book. <laughs> in, in fact, buy several copies. <laughs> but but uh, the, chapter two, of, it says the most important, by the, by the way, the first book, uh, Lo Mas Importante, has 20 chapters, and each one says the most important thing is, and then it's a different thing, because there are many things which are important. Chapter 2 says the most important thing is understanding market efficiency. Market efficiency says that, this is again, and this is another theory that I learned at Chicago, that because there are so many thousands or millions of people out there, and they all are studying investing, and they're all intelligent, and they're all computer literate, and they're all hardworking, and they're all uh, aggressive, and they're all informed, and they're all rational and objective, that, that the information that comes into the market is instantaneously reflected in prices, so that you can't get anything cheap. That's my summary. Markets are efficient in incorporating information. I believe that there are some markets which are very efficient, which are the markets for big stocks. When I, in 1978, when I moved from equities, stocks, to uh, debt, which was beginning to be interesting in the world, they said, what do you want to do next? I said, I'll do anything except spend the rest of my life choosing between Merck and Lilly. Merck and Lilly are two big drug stocks. Everybody knows everything about them that's to be known. How can I get an edge? How can I know more than others? So that's an efficient market. I believe there are inefficient markets where not everybody knows everything. And some, kinds, some of the unusual aspects of the debt market are some of those. Emerging markets are some of those, uh, et, et cetera. Real estate can be an, an inefficient market. So I believe that some markets are less efficient than others. I would only work in those. That's the most important thing. Because it, an efficient market is like a coin toss. You know, you flip a coin to decide something. If, the, if it's a fair coin and a fair flip, then you get heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time. And all your effort to predict whether it'll be heads or tails is for nothing. That's an efficient market. I wouldn't work there. But when we set up Oak Tree, our firm, we picked out some inefficient markets, and that's where we work. So I think that's the most important thing. And then the second thing is hire people who have better insight than others. Now, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, but I think that we can find people who can get a superior understanding of what a given company is going to do over the next few years. Work harder or make better inferences or something like that. And so I would hire those people. And I, in, in my, for my firm, I hire people who are team players, long-term thinkers, and who think along these lines rather than, you know, people who are just out for themselves and just think that they can figure out what's going to happen tomorrow better than others. Um, and, uh, and try to be a long-term investor. Again, nobody can figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, 
but everybody's trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow. Instead, spend your time thinking about what's going to happen in three years, and you can get an advantage that way. So those are examples. Thank you. Here's another question. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Marx. Thank you very much for the presentation. My First, pleasure. Uh, my question regards, as you mentioned before, there is a risk aversion in general. So mm -hmm. it's easier for an individual to buy when markets are falling than to sell maybe when markets are going up, when you are usually yes. long and you don't yes. do shorts. Yes. So given the difficulty on selling when markets go up or when companies go up, how you or your company, how you deal, when is the right moment to sell a company when you have a reference price in which mm. they reach but you mm. don't want to sell? Do you need to be accurate? Do you need to follow this kind of trend? What do you do? Well, uh, another good question. Uh, but, if, but think about your question. Things are rising. The price is above the reference price but you don't want to sell. Well, why not? And the answer is because you're human. Because you're afraid, it's, it's gone from already 50 to 100, but you're afraid that, that if it goes from 100 to 200 and you sell uh, at, at 100, you'll feel stupid. But, but if you buy a good company, yes. maybe you are failing on your valuation side, and the company will continue creating value on the mid-long term as well. Well, that, that's true, and by the way, there, there's nothing wrong. So if you remember what I said about cycle positioning, asset selection mark, so what, and, mark, and cycle positioning. So what you're saying, let me back that up and put that on there, if I can. There, uh, right there. So these are the two things you can do. So what, what this gentleman is saying is maybe you say, I only want to do asset selection. I don't want to do cycle positioning because Number one, it's hard to get cycle positioning right. And number two, if you do good asset selection and ignore cycle positioning, in the long run, you'll do OK. Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. I commend you for taking that attitude. Um, and and that's, called, that's what we call buy and hold. And a lot of people do buy and hold, and they do OK. So they, they buy here, then they hold here, and they hold here, and they hold here, and they hold here. And in the long run, you benefit from the uptrend, right? That's OK if you want to do that. The question is, can you do better? I believe that by becoming aggressive here and defensive here and aggressive here and defensive here, you can do a little better. So the question is whether you want to try. There's nothing invalid, incorrect, about what you say. The only question is, can you do better? And let me point something out. Number one, it's not easy to add value through working the cycles. And a friend of mine in, in England wrote a book about investing. It's called Simple But Not Easy. The things we want to do are clear. Doing them is not easy. And I was speaking with my son, who works with our family office, runs the family office, uh, about when I was writing the book. And I said, you know, I've made six, seven calls over the years, and I think they've all been about right. And he said to me, Dad, that's right, you made six times in 50 years. And, and of course, you know, he's correct. Once in a while, at the great extremes, 2000, when stocks were way high in the tech bubble, that was a great time to sell. Late 08, early 09, in the global financial crisis after the bankruptcy of Lehman, that was a great time to buy. But there was eight or nine years in between when there was nothing clever to do in this regard. So in other words, you don't get opportunities very often, but once a decade or twice a decade, you do get profound opportunities. And the question is whether you will take advantage of them or say, no, I'm a buy and hold guy, which is okay too. There, there's no right or wrong. Uh, hi, Mr. Marks. Thank you very much. Um, even though you can't predict the, the cycles and you say every cycle is different, mm -hmm. what would be the main similarities and differences that you see kind of 05 to 07 and where we are now, right? Because a lot of investors I speak to think that it's going to be 
much worse when it hits compared to 2008. Others think it's not going to be that much. W w when you think about those years before the crisis, how do you compare that to what's going on now? Well, I think that the main way in which it's worse today is that there's much more debt. Uh, and uh, the amount of what we call leverage finance, which is high yield bonds and leverage loans, is more than double from what it was in 07. Uh, and I think that's the main difference. And the, uh, the other thing is that uh, in the world, uh, we perceive, who I don't know what the truth is, but we perceive much bigger uh, macro you know, geopolitical uncertainties today. China, some guy named Trump, uh, <laughs> Brexit, uh, Spanish government, you know, who knows. Uh, so those are the challenges. I think that, though, I don't think we're in a bubble, and I don't think that we're going to have another global financial crisis experience. Why not? What's, how is it better today? Well, if you think about the global financial crisis of 07, 08, what happened? Number one, we had these things called uh, uh, subprime mortgages. Now, you go into a bank, you want to borrow money to buy a house. The banker says, yes, I will lend you money. You're a, I'll, if you say what your income is and what your assets are. He says, you sound pretty good. I'll lend you money at 5%. You say, well, I'd rather not document my earnings or my assets. He says, well, then we'll lend you money at 10%. You say, OK, I'll take it. Now, what would make you rather borrow money at 10% than 5%? And the answer is because you don't have the assets and the earnings that you claimed. So we call uh, subprime mortgages liar loans. And people took them out in the thousands. So they were fraudulent. There was no substance to them. And whole uh, huge quantities of investing was based on these lies. They were invested in in highly levered, tranched vehicles, CLOs, CDOs, CMOs. And the banks, which were very highly levered, 32 times equity capital, invested in the risky tranches of the levered structures that invested in, in the liar loans. So that was a compounding of risks. And you don't have that today, in my opinion. There is nothing as fraudulent today as the uh, 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 subprime mortgages. And the, the very little investing is taking place in the highly levered vehicles like CMOs. And the banks are not levered 32 times. So I just think uh, leverage is the, is the key to, to a meltdown. And I think that the, the, that the, the important, systemically important parts of the system are not as levered today as they were. So my, uh, my, you know, everybody says, what's the next bubble? Are we in a bubble? Everybody wants to talk about a bubble. Of course, because in the last 20 plus years, we've seen two bubbles, TMT bubble and subprime bubble, and two crashes. And so people get used to talking about bubbles. But we don't have to have bubbles all the time. We can just have normal ups and downs, which I think this is. And by the way, uh, the S&P 500 stock index is today selling at about 18 times annual earnings. The historic average is 15 or 16. So 18 is high but not terrible. In 2000, it was 32 times. That was a bubble. Today, it's not a bubble, in my opinion. Certain stocks are high, but the market is not. And um, you know, uh, I talk about bubbles in the book, and the one on cycles, the new one. And to me, an important characteristic of a bubble is people saying, this asset is like they did about the Nifty 50, which I told you about at the beginning, the great companies. People say, this is such a great investment, there's no price too high. Doesn't matter what you pay. No price too high. Those, and those words are terribly dangerous, and I don't hear them today. So I don't think we're in a bubble. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Maria Garrido. I, um, I would like to ask you about the strategies in real estate that Oak, Oak Tree has. 
if um, the opportunities, the debt, the income are linked just uh, with the cycles, how do you do it if it's just the opposite or yeah, basically? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, uh, our, our approach in real estate is, you know, again, in, in almost every investment category, including real estate, you can buy the greatest buildings in the greatest cities despite the high prices, New York, San Francisco, uh, et cetera, or you can buy lesser buildings in lesser cities at lower prices because they're not so great. And that's what we do more. So we are in the secondary cities like Las Vegas and Kansas City and places like that. And uh, we don't buy the big famous buildings, which are called trophy buildings in English. We buy lesser buildings. We don't use as much debt as other people. We don't develop buildings from the ground up, which can be highly profitable or dangerous. And we buy existing buildings cheaply and fix them up. So we hope it's a risk controlled uh, approach. Thank you. Sure. I'm not sure if you have any, any more questions. Um, Howard, we could be here for hours and hours listening to you, because um, you make it s sound so easy. And of course, we know that it isn't so. Uh, but we also know that you have a plane to catch. So um, we'll be having coffee for five or 10 minutes Great. with you. Okay. And I would just like to, to thank you My for pleasure. being so generous okay. and spending an hour and a half with us this morning. Miguel, muchas gracias a, a vosotros también. And let me just say that I've, I've added one more thing to your most important thing. Yes. And it's finding exceptional people like yourself that thank we you. can work with. Thank you. So thank you for being here with us today. Jose Ramon. Thank you. Thank you.